Okay, well, I'm back again. Uh, let's uh, continue on with our discussion of our hands-on session two, our example of um, of doing a, a hierarchical model, or a, you know, I guess we can call it a non nonlinear mixed effects model uh, using using Stan. So recall that we're going to be fitting. Actually, let me bring this up full screen. Uh, we're going to be fitting uh, the factor 10a inhibition values versus plasma concentrations uh, as a population model here across all of our volunteers. Uh, so we're basically fitting the curves that you're looking at here, uh, and we're going to allow for the possibility of some inter-individual variation in those curves. And we're going to use an, a sigmoid Emax model, as you see here, uh, as some residual, uh, simple residual or variation described by a normal distribution. And to keep it simple, we're just going to have one random effect. And in particular, we're going to model the log of our EC50 uh, as, a, as being normally distributed across the, uh, across the subjects. And I threw in some uh, weekly uh, informative priors for a uh, number of our parameters here. Okay, so we're going to go to the files I mentioned to you here, at least the first ones, uh, and take a look at what we need to do with that. So, so we're going to be taking a look first at our stand, stand file here. Let's shrink that guy. Uh, And let's keep the model up here. I'll we'll come back to that periodically as a, we work on that. And so let's bring up our stand file. Let me close some of this stuff. Okay, so uh, where'd it go here? So FXA inhibit one dot stand. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna open that with my R Studio. Okay, it's going to be weird on me, huh? Here, let's do it the other way. Let's just open up our studio and then read it in that way. Uh, I have to pardon me. I think I mentioned before I'm not a regular. Uh, oh, it looks like I, when I closed it, I already had it in there, so that solves that problem. Okay, so we're going to build this up. Uh, as I mentioned before, you could use the previous example uh, that I presented you uh, for, remember we did that, sort of model-based uh, model based meta-analysis of some dose response data that used a hierarchical model and we're gonna we could use that as a template but here I'm gonna show you sort of the the worked result here uh, so the data that we're gonna pass in uh, is gonna consist mainly of these pieces right here I'm gonna specify the number of subjects the number of observations uh, and f for each observation, I'm going to have a variable here called subject, uh, which is going to take on integer values from one up to the number of subjects, or n subjects, as this is called here. Uh, and then each observation is also associated with a concentration and a factor 10a inhibition value. And so you can see I just use fairly simple names, COBS for the concentrations, FXA for the, uh, for the factor 10a inhibition. In here, uh, let's, uh, rather than focus on the declarations, let's look at where the, the calculation part comes in. And then we can, and in fact, just to mention, when I write these things, usually the way I start is I actually usually write out the math first, the calculations, and then fill in, uh, and then fill in the declarations afterwards. Uh, that's the simplest way I usually <coughs> find to do this, or at least it's the way that works best conceptually for me. So the main calculations are sort of the deterministic parts. We'll do in so recall we'll do inside transform parameters, uh, and that's happening. 
uh, right over here and the main piece is in this loop here so I'm going as you can see I'm looping over over all the observations for I in one to n obs and for each one of those I'm going to calculate a uh, an average or a predicted uh, factor 10a inhibition which I'm going to call fxa hat and so for the ith one of those you can see it's going to be emax times the concentration, the ith concentration raised to the gamma power divided by, well, we're going to have EC50 raised to the gamma and a C obs again, our concentration raised to the gamma. And the key thing in here is recall the approach we used with that model based meta analysis example was for any, uh, for any random effect we selected the appropriate element of re the appropriate value of that random effect by in by using a nested index here so you can see for my ec50 i'm going to select the value for for the subject who's associated with the ith observation in here thus the nested indexing so that's the approach we're going to use here uh, now it happens I'm going to be specifying uh, the uh, inter-individual variability in EC50 in terms of the log of EC50, uh, which is what's happening down here in the model block. So here we're specifying the inter-individual variability in EC50, and I'm doing that as a recall as a normal distribution. In fact, let's remind ourselves uh, the way I specified it. Uh, right here. So I'm going to have the log of EC50 is normally distributed uh, with the mean equal to log of EC50 hat and a uh, standard deviation omega EC50. Uh, and so right here is the equivalent statement uh, in STAN. Uh, so log EC50 is going to be distributed normal with a mean equal to the log of EC50 hat and a standard deviation of omega EC50. Uh, so that takes care of our inter-individual variability. Uh, key, the re now when I do this, now notice the right-hand side, both of these elements in here are actually just scalars, but this thing on the left-hand side, this log EC50, uh, actually, I'm gonna, I want to be able to generate log EC50s for each individual. So I want that thing to be a vector uh, of values with a length equal to the number of subjects. So when I declare that, which I do up uh, where I'm going, do, 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 do. yeah, do right here, uh, notice that this is a vector with n subjects n subjects values in here and uh, Stan is smart enough to recognize that if it sees on the left hand side a vector of multiple values that it will generate you know that it will associate each of those elements with this normal distribution as specified on the right hand side so I don't have to for example you know in particular I don't have to put it inside of a loop that where I'm looping over all those individuals, it's enough to write it as a statement, uh, which is going to treat it as a vector operation. Uh, similarly, down here, we have our likelihood statement, where we're saying that my factor 10a inhibition is normally distributed with some mean FXA hat and some standard deviation sigma. In this case, FXA hat actually is a vector uh, with, you know, n observation values. And in fact, that's declare, uh, where do we declare that? Somewhere in, uh, reminding myself, oh yeah, here we go. So you can see I've declared that here. So it's got n observation values and recall that in this loop we calculated it for, you know, a separate value for each observation. And then on the left hand side, the FXA is a date, is data which again, if we step back up to our data declarations here again, it's a vector of, uh, with n obs values. Uh, so again, this takes care of my likelihood in a single statement. 
I don't need to put it inside of a loop. Now, again, you could put it inside of a loop where I'd do it as a loop over I, you know, N1 to N obs values, uh, but it turns out that's, a, that's less efficient and will result in slower calculations if you were to do that. So those are kind of our core pieces. In addition, uh, within the model block, we have our, our prior distributions. And if you look over these, you'll see they match up. In fact, can we sort of do that side by side here? Uh, you can see that these match up with what we have on the left. You know, Emax is uniform 0 to 100. That's exactly what we have here. EC50 hat. It says it's half normal, 0 to 50. Well, this is normal 0 to 50, but, in it, but when we declare EC50 hat, we're going to want to do this, where when we declare it, we specify a lower bound of 0. And recall, again, that when you do that, that's equivalent to creating a truncated distribution for EC50 hat or equivalent to the statement here. It turns out, in this case, then to be a half normal. Um, and the same sort of thing is going on with gamma, again, half normal, 0, 5, sigma, Cauchy, 0, 10, or again, since they bounded below by 0, it's actually a half Cauchy. And omega EC50, well, if I wrote it right, it'll be a half Cauchy, 0, 1, and by golly, that's what we have. Okay, so we've taken care of those. So that's kind of all of our key model components, and then once you've written those equations and specified names for your various variables, then you have to go back and fill in with the appropriate declarations and where necessary include bounds on the various components here. Uh, so that's, let's see, is there much I want to say about those beyond that? Uh, not really, just a reminder that, you know, about bounds, you can specify both lower and upper. Uh, or one or the other, so, and we have an example here with Emacs where both a lower and upper is specified. Uh, I think most of the rest of them either have no bounds or they have a lower bound on the various values. So that's our, that's our core model in this. Uh, the other part then is in order to be able to have some uh, posterior predictions to help us assess model fit. Uh, we have some additional calculations going on inside of our generated quantities block. Uh, the first part, <coughs> excuse me, is our so-called individual predictions. Those are the easy ones to do because we basically just have to do the equivalent of the likelihood statement here. Uh, and that's what this is. Uh, it's uh, and but and but what's the but I was going to say. Uh, uh, with Stan, you have to use somewhat different syntax when you're doing uh, simulations as opposed to specifying the likelihood. Uh, and that difference here is we have to use the functions that end in underscore R and G. And the functions that end in underscore R and G cannot be written in vectorized terms. Uh, so you have to, that one I do have to enclose that in a loop. As you see here, where we go from, one, from I in 1 to N obs and generate the values and what I'm and what I call this FXA con then is the individual predictions or if you like the uh, predictions conditioned on the individual random effect values in this case the individual EC50 values uh, but that just means I'm going to use the same FXA hat on the right hand side that we used up in the likelihood that's the easy part to do the population predictions. Again, those are predicting uh, new observations in, in new patients as opposed to the previous one, which was new observations in the same patients. Uh, we also have to generate new values for, uh, for the random effects uh, and simulate those from our population distribution. So that's going on inside this, where I'm looping over 1 to n subjects and generating a new set of EC50 values. Called it here log EC50 pred. Uh, again, it's normal RNG on the right-hand side. Uh, this is just uh, converting it to EC50 instead of log EC50. Uh, 
AX if I wanted to. I could have done that all in one in the previous loop, but uh, I find it easier to read this way. Uh, then we have to generate a new FXA hat value that depends upon that EC50 pred. So we can see here a statement that's uh, essentially identical to what we did back up here in the transform parameters block that's essentially identical to this statement except that we're using EC50 pred and FXA hat pred in the statement right here and finally we have the the final prediction of our observation values where we add the residual variability on top and that provides the tools we want to do some simple posterior predictive checks where we can look at uh, basically uh, well the main thing you can look at with this will be the uh, time courses you can look at the factor 10a inhibition versus time you can also look at the individual level and look at uh, the fxa the factor 10a inhibition versus concentration within each individual now what would be nice is it would also be good to be able to look at uh, sort of more get a more global look at the factor 10a inhibition versus concentration and do a posterior predictive check that across all of the individuals but that gets complicated by the fact that each individual has different set of concentrations uh, so if you really want to do a, a posterior predictive distribution across all the subjects for a given concentration uh, you, we have to do something else to accomplish that and the approach I use here is to just specify a uh, a grid of concentrations and and that's what's going on in this next step down here where I'm just generating what I've termed here C sim which are simply a it's just a grid of concentrations going from C min to C max and in particular I'm going to generate n sim such values and that's those notice are things that I specified back up here as data so that's that's something then that the user can specify you want to spe here I'm going to specify how many concentrations I want to generate predictions for and the minimum and maximum value of those concentrations uh, and then down here I just simply you know given those specifications I can generate the particular set of concentrations that are equally spaced going from C min to C max and then I'm generating another set of posterior predictions and instead of calling them like EC50 pred or FXA pred I'm calling them I stuck I stuck a pred 2 on them so here for instance I'm generating the uh, uh, the EC50 pred 2 uh, or log EC50 pred 2 here for uh, for the very for the patients in here actually I just realized I did a little extra trick in here um, in this case where we're predicting potential future subjects I'm no longer sort of bound to the to the set of subjects we actually have in this study uh, so I can generate however many I want so in this particular case uh, I figure okay why not just go ahead and generate a broader broader collection so for each separate predicted concentration I'm actually generating a new EC50 you can think of this as being the equivalent to only getting one sample per patient uh, for these things and there'd be other ways we could do this uh, but that's but that way works just fine here so I'm just going to do this log EC50 pred 2 for each one of these um, of these n sim uh, concentrations here uh, actually did I say that right let me think of, I'm thinking out loud here yeah I think we're fine anyway sorry uh, whenever I come back to these things I always have to recheck my own logic okay so we're gonna go ahead and generate that in there and keep in mind we're not only doing this across these end sims uh, internally we're doing this for each iteration uh, across these things so it's 
So we're, we're in good shape there by having the however many thousand uh, posterior samples we're going to generate. Anyway, so okay, just EC50 pred2, I calculate from the log EC50 pred2, and then finally a new FXA hat value corresponding to that, and finally the uh, predicted observation value where we add in the residual variability. Uh, in the end, it'll be probably clear what I'm trying to do here when we actually look at the corresponding plot that corresponds to that. Uh, and let's take a look at, while we're at this, at the R script that corresponds to it. The first parts of the R, R script are the same boilerplate we've been dealing with uh, all along. Uh, again, we have to be more model specific when we specify uh, the data and the initial estimates. Uh, in here, the data just matches up to the uh, components I had already specified in the uh, in the stand model. Uh, recall the CMIN, CMAX, and NSIM here. So notice I'm going to specify that I want to generate uh, values for concentrations equally spaced over the interval 0 to 1600, and I'm going to generate 201 such uh, concentrations over that range. Uh, see most of this again that's old hat going to go ahead and do a, a thousand burn in and a thousand post burn in per for each one of four chains so again that's no new story there uh, and this is again all boilerplate until we get to the posterior uh, predictive distributions uh, this will look very close to what was set up for the um, for that model-based meta-analysis we did before. Uh, I think I used largely the same setup here, just throwing various uh, tidyverse bits at this to generate uh, the appropriate uh, prediction intervals here, in this case 90% prediction intervals, and then some ggplot stuff uh, to generate the plots. You can see I'm going to facet this over the various subjects in here. Uh, so those parts are pretty much what we did before. Uh, the part that changes is when we get down to this part where I do the plot by concentration, uh, where uh, here I've just gone ahead and uh, I didn't output those uh, predicted con the what I called C sim I guess inside the uh, the stand model. I didn't output them, so here I'll just regenerate them here. It's just a simple single statement to do that. Uh, I get the, uh, oops, I just made a mistake there. Um, here's where I go ahead and again generate the prediction intervals uh, and do the plots here where I'm going to be doing, uh, this is not going to be a panel plot, this is going to be a single panel where we're going to look at the uh, posterior predictions across all of the subjects uh, overlaid on their data. So let's see what that looks like. Uh, we'll do that from here. Oh, I guess we should actually go ahead and run this, shouldn't we? Uh, this one doesn't take too long, so we can go ahead and do it during actual course time. So let's just go ahead and make this run. Oh, I did my usual dum-dum here. Let's see. Actually, am I in the right our studio place? Yes, I forgot to take us to uh, where we want to be. Where the heck am I here? Good question. Okay, let's go into... Sorry, I'm not where I wanted to be there. Okay, now I'm where I want to be. Let's go ahead and uh, we're in script. Let's go ahead and set the working directory because that's the mistake I made. Uh, let's clear the decks so we don't have to look at that. Let's do that again.
this one once it does the uh, compilation as I recall only requires a couple of minutes here so two minutes seems amazingly long when you've got dead air Okay, so now it's just doing the wrap up. I see an issue that we're going to be talking about in a minute here. Uh, there were some divergent transitions uh, that we're going to want to see if we can do something about. Okay, and okay, where we go? So it ran. Uh, there was one issue that popped up. Uh, you can see here it said there were some divergent transitions in here and proposes trying to increase the adapt delta to see if that might resolve that. Uh, we can certainly attempt to do that. Uh, that's the logical first step. Uh, to try and resolve that and that we can do I actually have some code that I already had handy for that let's go ahead and see what happens if we change this is and by the way this is what they mean when they say you know increasing adapt delta well there's various control parameters we can set using this uh, control argument to Stan and one of them is something called adapt delta so what the default adapt delta is 0.8 so let's try to increment it to maybe 0.9 and see what happens Feel free to fast forward through this section.
and maybe I'll make a comment here while while this is finishing up. If what we're looking for is to see if increasing ADAPT Delta either eliminates or at least reduces uh, the number of divergent transitions. Uh, if it does, great, that's sufficient, uh, and you can just move on. Uh, if it, you know, if you just, if it is better, if you see a, you know, if it's not completely gone, but you see a decrease, yeah, maybe, you know, increase it a bit more uh, and to see if you can get rid of the rest of them. If, on the other hand, you don't see a decrease, uh, you really need to consider alternatives to try and uh, deal with it to make sure you're adequately uh, sampling all of the um, all of the distribution of interest, uh, in which case we typically resort to some sort of uh, reparameterization of the model uh, to try and improve the sampling characteristics and eliminate those divergent transitions. And we actually kind of saw, if you saw it going by here, is it going to let me go up without it? Uh, notice that I think we had before we had three divergent transitions, well now we have six, so we obviously didn't improve the situation, uh, which suggests that we may have to explore a, another strategy for, uh, for uh, improving the sampling in this. Uh, and actually, that's what's referenced uh, when you look down in the files. As notice, it says it refers to using a non-centered parameterization to improve sampling efficiency and prevent divergent transitions. And so I've actually written an alternative version of the model, uh, which uses the non-centered uh, uh, non-centered parameterization for our random effects or random effect in this case. Uh, so why don't we actually take a look at that. Uh, so let's see. So this was our original stand model here. Let's go back up to where our random effects are actually dealt with and let's go ahead and open up going back to the model directory here and open up uh, FXA inhibit one ncp.stan. Uh, and actually, let's see, I think I can open this as a separate thing, can't I? Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to put them side by side here. Okay, so, uh, a couple of differences we'll find in here. Uh, Notice that, well, let me show you the, where the main difference happens, and that shows up uh, in between the, well, let's sort of use a mix of the transform parameters uh, here and the model block. So in the transform parameters block before, uh, let's see, is that where I want to talk about it? No, let's talk about it. Oops, I just hid what I wanted to see there. Uh, let's bring it back in. Uh, notice in our original, our, we just said log EC50 is normal with the e mean equal to log EC50 hat, standard deviation of omega EC50. We're going to change the approach, uh, and instead of directly getting the EC50, we're instead going to generate a set of standard normals. Uh, in other words, normal things that are distributed normal with mean zero and standard deviation one. We'll call it eta, I guess consistent with the sort of non-MEM style practice here. And so we're going to do that, and then we're going to generate our EC50s uh, indirectly uh, from that. And in particular, uh, so here we get our log EC50 here and just do an exponentiation up here to get our EC50. Well, instead, we're going to do this up here. We're going to take our standard normal ETAs and from those generate our EC50s here from, you can see EC50 hat times E to the omega EC50 times ETA. Uh, and that would be what's, what's often termed a non-centered parameterization for doing this. And with with hierarchical models like these, with random effects models, uh, that will often help 
uh, improve the sampling characteristics and in particular help uh, eliminate the the need for uh, for well eliminate the occurrence of the divergent transitions uh, and w so we can go illustrate that let's go ahead and run uh, the model that's parameterized in that fashion uh, we'll have to bring up the corresponding R script back to our script files so that's uh, yeah FXA inhibit 1 NCP and go ahead and run that one uh, let's see do I have it make sure I just want to make sure I'm not already yeah let's knock off the adapt Delta first and see what happens if we just use that without monkeying with the adapt Delta see if that's enough to fix things And again, feel free to fast forward at this point. Oh, still got a couple of divergent transitions in there. So we'll do the one additional step and uh, throw in the uh, adjustment to adapt delta after this wraps up. Okay, and one more time.
And while that's running, why don't we take a look at uh, some of the results that actually got generated from, uh, from some of those. Uh, let's take a look at some of the figures that came out. This is for the, uh, the original parameterization, the so-called centered parameterization. Uh, now, one good thing is there was no sign of convergence problems. You can see the R hats are all pretty small. Uh, nothing special one way or the other on that. Uh, there's certainly plenty of autocorrelation on some of the parameters there. Um, Nothing too shocking here. You do see the little red marks here correspond to where those divergent transitions had occurred uh, in the uh, in the centered parameterization. Uh, there's no obvious extreme um, pathologies here, though the one chain does seem to have kind of made a bit of an excursion over here, right around where uh, uh, where the divergent transitions show up. Uh, they do all seem to be describing roughly the same distributions. That was a pretty clean. Uh, and I think I may have mentioned on an earlier example, you can actually, it's probably hard to see on it from there, but there's a few red dots in here that also correspond to where the divergent transitions occurred. And we can go through and see our, our fits for all at the individual level here where we're just looking at the factor 10a inhibition versus concentration for each individual subject here and we can do that you see more of course as we get to higher doses you get a more complete uh, characterization of the uh, of the overall concentration response relationship uh, and we've obviously we Got a pretty good fit here, not surprising since we fit basically the same model that was used to simulate the data. Then for our population predictions, of course, we get much wider uh, prediction bounds in here because it also includes the inter-individual variability. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot we're also looking at something different here. Here I'm looking at the now the, the response versus time instead of versus concentration. And these are misspoke there. These are actually still individual predictions. Now we get to the population predictions, which are a little broader, although not a humongous amount because the inter-individual variability here was not all that great. Um, so they're not all that markedly wider. Finally, this was uh, that bit there where I was generating concentrations at equal, at equal intervals over the 0 to 1600 range. Uh, and then generating posterior predictions for each of those. Uh, that's what's shown here, where I've now got all of the all of the data is now plotted on a single plot, and then I've got my 90% credible intervals uh, as a function of concentration also being plotted here, along with the posterior mean going up up the middle of them. So that's what was going on with with that part of it. And what went wrong over here? Broke something. We may step past this while I... Here. Okay, what did I do wrong? And... Ah. Yep, I goofed. Uh, when I edited it there to add the uh, control back in, I forgot a piece. Thus the junk that was there. Let's go ahead and clear that nonsense out. Clear console. Go ahead and save this thing. I should have looked before. Okay, I'll let that run there. Uh, let's see, is there anything else I can do to show you here? Uh, well, we'll be digging into this once it fixes that. I don't think there's much to tell you from the table. Uh, let's go to linear. There we go. As long as it's running here, we'll go ahead and 
So that. Uh, not a lot to say about it here. Uh, then you can obviously see the um, the parameter estimates in here. I guess I'll point out here's our effective sample sizes and of our key parameters here. The worst of them was uh, uh, you know 688 here for the Emax, but generally looking in pretty good shape uh, for at least getting good descriptions of our central tendency. Our hats are clean. Okay, the only thing I'm waiting for here is just to make sure that we really get a run here without any divergent transitions. And just to emphasize again, when you if you do see divergent transitions, they can they sometimes indicate a pathology you do you should be correcting. The first approach to correcting it is by setting adapt delta at a larger value. Uh, seeing if that improves uh, the and if that does not improve matters then uh, resort to uh, resort to reparameterization the first approach to reparameterization if it's a hierarchical model like this is to change the sampling of the random effects from a centered to a non-centered parameterization Dum -de dum -de dum Ah, still got one left over. Well, I'm not going to drag this out any further. Uh, the next step might be to knock it up to 0.95. Uh, if that doesn't do it, uh, then we may have to consider other kinds of... Uh, reparameterizations in this uh, when we're dealing with uh, asymptotic models like Emax models uh, sometimes the uh, sometimes those result in rather difficult posteriors that have some pretty sharp ridges in that that sometimes the leapfrog method has trouble following uh, and there are ways that you could reparameterize the Emax model that might further improve the situation but we're not going to drag this one out any further we'll, we'll talk a bit more about dealing with divergent transitions when we get to a multivariate case okay so let's move back to our slides